What is a unit cell? In this video, we'll cover all the basic concepts, such as why this and this is a unit cell, but this isn't, and we'll cover things like cell parameters and Miller indices and make them easy to understand. And keep watching to hear about a great resource which goes into great detail on vast aspects of crystallography. Now, I've always found that explanations of unit cells seem to come in one of two distinct varieties. Either they're just too simple and they're lacking in concepts that we need to understand and sometimes even containing errors, or they're just far too complex and frankly, badly written. So in this video, I'm going to give you a kind of a bridge from the very simple ideas and go over towards things like cell parameters and lattices and Miller indices and get you started on your deeper studies into crystallography. So let's start with a very simple analogy of a crystal, some wallpaper. Now let's imagine you're going to get uh, some wallpaper printed from a company online and they're going to print your very own custom design. Now obviously you don't need to send a big GIF file with all the hundreds of patterns laid out exactly as you want them on hundreds of rolls of wallpaper. You only need to send them one smallest bit of the pattern that they can repeat in two dimensions and then print out as many rolls of wallpaper as you want. Well, let's call this smallest bit of your pattern a unit tile. So let's begin by calling the picture in our pattern a motif. Now, as we are cutting out our unit tile, we want to be careful with how much space we put around the motif because that space is important. Including the space is important for determining the spacing of our final pattern on the wallpaper. The next point is that we need that shape of the unit tile to tessellate because we don't want any gaps between our tiles. And finally, everything's a lot easier if we don't have to rotate or reflect our unit tiles every other motif. In fact, it's much easier if we just choose our unit tile so that the only thing we need to do is translate it in two dimensions. Note that even within one pattern, there are different ways to cut a unit tile. In this first example, we can see the motif nice and clearly. In the second tile, we've really cut up the motif, but now we can see the spaces between them very easily. Neither tile is the right one or the correct one, but they are better for different things. For example, the second motif might be good if you want to send it to a graphic designer and maybe ask them to put in another motif in those spaces. Now we can also take two patterns and put them together to make a third pattern. For example, here we have a pattern of moles and a pattern of conical flasks, and we can lay them on top of each other to make a new pattern. And this third pattern has its own unit tiles. We can make this unit tile, which has the conical flasks in the corners and a moly in the center, or we can have this unit tile, which has our moly in the corners and the flask at the center. Either unit tile is perfectly fine, but each one gives us slightly different information. And importantly, both unit tiles contain the same number of moles and flasks. That's two moles and two flasks. And we would call this arrangement an interpenetrating arrangement of moles and conical flasks. Crystals are similar to wallpaper, except they are patterns that repeat in three dimensions. And instead of looking at a unit tile, we are looking at a unit cell. 
and just like for wallpaper, it makes a lot more sense and it's a lot easier to look at just the unit cell instead of having to try and think about our whole crystal, which is full of wazillions and gajillions of atoms or ions. In fact, it's better to look at a unit cell than even a very small fragment of real crystal. Now, even though we've started talking about crystals, it's important to realise that unit cells are not a real thing. A unit cell is just an imaginary volume of space. What often confuses people is that this, for example, is a unit cell, and so is this. But this isn't, and neither is this. So what's going on? Well, very simply, remember that a unit cell must be able to build up the whole crystal just by translation in three dimensions. This is called a body-centred cubic structure. And these atoms in the middle don't get copied properly when we translate this cluster into three dimensions. That means that this cluster is not a unit cell. And to make a unit cell for the body-centred cubic structure, we actually have to chop off the tops and sides and bottom of that cube. And then we have this cubic shape. Now, of course, we can't really cut pieces of atom off. And that is an example of why unit cells are imaginary. And just like for our unit tile, our unit cell does not need to be rotated or reflected to build up the whole crystal. It is only translated. Now, just like with our wallpaper pattern, we can make different unit cells that give us different information about the crystals. In this unit cell for sodium chloride or table salt, we can see that there are chloride ions around the outside of the cell and a sodium ion sitting in the middle. But if we look at this unit cell, it's still sodium chloride, except this time we've got sodium ions around the outside and a chloride ion sitting in the middle. Either of those unit cells is perfectly fine. In principle, you can make any unit cell you like. You can make them as large as you like. And sometimes we deal with larger unit cells when we want to get a feel of what the whole crystal looks like. But usually, if you make a unit cell any larger than it needs to be, you're just making things unnecessarily complicated for yourself. So let's have a look at three classic textbook examples now. Our first example unit cell is the simple cubic cell, the one we've looked at before. Now, if we look at it more carefully, we can imagine cutting it straight down the middle. And in fact, there are three ways we can do this, straight top to bottom, left to right, and front to back. And so we can imagine that it would be quite easy to cut this crystal apart. Or it might be quite easy for the atoms to slip past each other. So maybe crystals with this structure would be quite weak to breaking apart or to deforming. This example here is called the body-centered cubic cell because there is the atom right in the middle in the center of the body. Now that plane, that gap for cutting the crystal has gone because we've got an atom in the center. And if we look at this example, the face-centered cubic example that we looked at before, we can see we've really filled the cell up with atoms now. Those cleavage planes are still there, but they are much harder to find, much harder to access. So we would expect this face-centered cubic cell to perhaps be the strongest one of all. And also, let's have a look at the density of these cells. In the simple cubic case, we have eight one-eighths of an atom, so in that unit cell there is only one complete atom. In the body-centered cubic cell, we've got our eight one-eighths again and one whole atom right in the center, so we've got two whole atoms in this cell. And finally, in our face-centered cubic cell, we have a total of four atoms in that unit cell. So we can also learn about the density of our crystal by looking only at the unit cell. And this is extremely useful. Iron, for example, can take all three of these crystal structures that we build up from these unit cells. 
and which one it has depends on the conditions that we subject that iron to. How hot is it? What pressure is it under? At different temperatures and different pressures, we will get different crystal structures built up from different unit cells. And this is a large part of the work of metallurgists, trying to design an alloy, for example, that will force these atoms, these metal atoms, to have the unit cell that they want, to get the properties of uh, malleability or hardness or density that they want from that particular metal alloy. Now, something that often confuses people is the idea of patterns overlapping and interpenetrating. Remember, we looked at this with the wallpaper example. Well, the same thing can happen in three dimensions. If we look at this crystal of cesium chloride, it looks here to be a body-centered unit cell. We've got chloride ions on the outside and our positive cesium ion sitting on the inside. We have the alternative with our chloride ion sitting on the inside and our cesium ions sitting on the outside now. But if we look at the cesium ions by themselves, we can see that just the cesium ions make up a simple cubic pattern. And if we look at the chloride ions by themselves, we see that just the chloride ions make up a simple cubic pattern of chloride ions. So we can then say that the cesium chloride crystal is made from two interpenetrating simple cubic patterns of cesium ions and chloride ions. And sodium chloride does the same thing, except with more complex interpenetrating face-centered cubic patterns. Okay, so now we've looked at the basics of unit cells. How can we really unlock their potential? Well, as usual with the physical sciences, if we just bring in a bit of maths, we can really extend our knowledge and start making predictions. At the beginning, at least, the maths isn't so difficult, but I usually find that textbooks mix up the mathematics and the chemistry into a horrible, confusing mess. So let's just get started by separating those two things. We're going to focus right down on the maths and keep it nice and simple. But before we go on, if you're finding this video helpful, please click the like button and give the channel a boost. Thanks. So back in the 19th century, it had already been hypothesized that crystals were made of small repeating units. And a physicist called Auguste Brevet decided to look at the mathematics of 3D shapes and find out exactly which shapes could fill up a whole 3D space, leaving no gaps, only by translation. And it turns out that there's seven of them. The next thing he did was to put points on them and see where you could put points onto these seven shapes to build up an infinitely repeating pattern called a lattice in three dimensions. And it turns out that there's only 14 ways to do that. These are called the Bravais lattices. Now, this really makes things simple because we've greatly reduced the possibilities for building up anything into a crystal. So now we can describe our unit cells in terms of just six parameters. We've got three lengths, A, B and C, and three angles, alpha, beta and gamma. The lengths are usually measured in terms of angstroms or nanometers, and the angles are usually measured in terms of degrees. Now that we have our brave lattice, we just choose the correct lattice and just stick our atoms or ions or molecules onto the points where those lattice points are. And it's important to understand that the lattice is a mathematical construct. But once we put our atoms onto there, we are now building up a real thing. In fact, our atoms go onto those brave lattice points like the motifs, like the pictures on our wallpaper. 
and for this reason we call them motifs when we insert them into our brave lattice. But now that we are putting real things into those positions, we are building up something real and we call that a crystal structure. So the lattice and the crystal structure are different things. And yes, I did make that mistake in my chemistry of crystals video. Stop going on about it! Now, there's one more really important topic to understand about crystals, and that's the topic of planes. If we take a look at the lattice, we can see that we can join points in the lattice using two-dimensional planes that extend to infinity. And if we go back to a real crystal structure, we can see that these gaps, these planes, have a real physical significance. But it's not just about cutting crystals. It's also about things like surfaces, because every surface of a crystal will be along a plane of some sort. And it also tells us how X-rays will scatter off of the atoms themselves when we are analysing that crystal to discover its atomic or molecular structure. Now, we can discuss these planes using only three numbers, known as Miller indices, after the mineralogist William Miller, and labelled with the letters HKL. So, very simply, we have our three dimensions, labelled X, Y, Z, along which our length parameters A, B, C lie, which are related by the three angles alpha, beta, gamma, and joined by Miller indices H, K, and L, and this is not, apparently, confusing at all! Anyway, as I was saying, it's much easier to understand these planes using mathematical lattices. And one of the reasons is we don't need to worry about real distances here. We can just label the A direction as A and the B direction as B and the C direction as C and just use those letters. We can just say we're going to go 1A this way, we're going to go 1B that way and 2Cs that way. So that makes our numbers nice and simple, 1, 1 and 2. So now we're just going to set up three really easy rules. The first one is that we are going to set an origin, a starting point, and it makes things ever so simple if we just put that origin right in one of the corners. Next up, we're going to say that we only start counting planes after we start moving. In other words, any planes that are right on that origin don't count. And finally, we are going to use some vectors. Nothing difficult. We're just going to say that moving from the origin into the unit cell and everything in that direction is a positive number. And moving from the unit cell back towards the origin or even from the origin out of the unit cell, everything in that direction is going to be a negative number. So let's have a look at this plane. You can see that it cuts through the lattice at one A length from our origin. So let's give this index a number one. And how many B lengths does it take for it to cross through the B axis? Well, there's our problem, because it doesn't. And it doesn't cut through the C axis either, ever. So what do we do? Do we write in maybe an infinity for our k and our l numbers? Well, the problem is we don't like writing infinities, certainly not in, in sciences. It's very messy. So there is a very simple solution. We just turn our numbers upside down. Now our number one for h is still a number one, but our infinities for k and l are now zero. Nice, comfortable zeros. So that's what we're going to do for everything. Instead of just simply putting in how many lengths, we're going to take our length as a number or a fraction, and we're going to turn it upside down. We're going to take the reciprocal, because that clears out all of our nasty infinities. This plane then would have Miller indices HKL of 2, 0, 1. And this plane, which looks very similar, is slightly different because we have to start either at the top of the cell and work backwards towards the origin, or we start 
outside the cell on the bottom and move up towards the origin. Either way, that's a negative number for our vector. Now that minus gets in the way, so we just move it on top of the one. So it's 201 with a bar on top of the one. So now we can discuss entire infinite two-dimensional planes that cut through our unit cell using only three numbers. An important thing to note is that all of these planes are part of an infinite family of planes that are all parallel to each other. Basically, they're just the same plane shifted along a bit. And now, if we look at all of the planes cutting through our unit cell, we can now see that the Miller index represents how many slices those planes make out of our unit cell in that direction. But there's a third way of looking at what Miller indices mean. Remember that these planes are part of a family. Well, we can also use the Miller indices to say how many of those planes slice through our unit cell. This example is the 301 cell. You can see that moving along in the A direction, we encounter three planes inside our unit cell. Remember, we don't count any planes that touch the zero. So this gives us three ways to look at what Miller indices mean, and they are all correct. They all work. You can choose whichever one makes the most sense to you. Simple, right? And so much easier than the unnecessarily complicated that we usually have to wade through when we're reading about these concepts in textbooks. All right, so where have we got to? Well, now that we understand about Miller indices, we can talk about real planes running through crystals using just three numbers. And keep in mind that the surfaces of crystals all occur along a plane as well. So now we can talk about surfaces using just these three numbers. In fact, crystal planes are so important that material scientists will come to recognize a certain set of Miller indices and know exactly what that means in their field of research. If we take the face-centered cubic structure of metals like platinum, for example, that are used in catalysts, we can see that cutting along different planes gives us very different surfaces. And surfaces are essential for catalysis. This surface, cut along the 111 plane, for example, is very smooth. Now that could mean that a molecule could settle on that surface and move around freely until it finds its partner molecule to react with, which is how this catalyst makes the reaction faster. But it could also mean that that molecule would fly away again before it's had a chance to react. If we cut the molecule along the 110 plane, however, we get these deep grooves running along the surface. Now that could be good because those grooves could pull a molecule in and distort its electron cloud and make it more vulnerable to breaking up and make it more reactive. Or on the other hand, it could trap the molecule, stop it from moving around and hide it from other reactants. Finally, the 100 plane is halfway between those two. It's mostly flat, but with little potholes on a square grid. So material scientists will know exactly what those sets of Miller indices mean, and they will grow their crystals specially to get exactly the surface that they want. So let's take all of this that we've looked at so far and see what it means for macro scale crystals. Now they don't always have the same shapes as their original unit cells. But that's because the unit cells don't always grow out in the same directions evenly. They will often find it easier to grow in one particular direction than another direction. And that's because of things like solution concentration or temperature or pressure. And this is why snowflakes are so different. As our water crystal grows from individual molecules of water vapor, it will experience different levels of humidity, 
different levels of temperature and different levels of pressure. And as each tiny nanocrystal goes through the cloud, it's going to have a completely different story to another one that might have started off near it. And different conditions will favour different ways of growing the crystal. Some conditions might help the crystal to grow out along its long edges. Other conditions might help it grow out at the points. So even though every snowflake is built from a hexagon arrangement of water molecules, our final snowflakes look very different. But you can see they all have this six-fold symmetry, and that's because they are all based on those hexagons. So there you go. Unit cells explain everything about crystals. Except they don't. But the chemistries of crystal surfaces and nanoparticles and quasi-crystals are a video for another day. Well, I hope that's helped you understand the basics of unit cells. But there's a lot more to discuss and a lot more depth, especially if you want to get into this subject at much greater detail. And on that topic, I want to tell you about a great resource that I found. It's a YouTube course on crystallography by Frank Hoffman. There's a link in the description, so check it out. If you like this video, check out my other video on the chemistry of crystals. It's got more animations and actual crystal growing experiments. I'm sure you'll love it.